Hello and good day and welcome to wherever you are listening to us today. It is Friday, 23 April 2021. My name is Christian Lindmeier and I'm welcoming you to today's special event, the one year anniversary virtual event for the Accelerator, the ACT Accelerator. We have a long list of special guests which I will spare you from reading through now and you've all seen the media advisory hopefully. I will leave it to the Director General, of course, to make the introduction to all our special guests. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus we have Portuguese and Hindi. Now present in the room today are Dr. Tedros Adhanam Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General. Dr. Bruce Aylward, Special Advisor to the Director General and the lead on the ACT Accelerator. Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist of WHO, and Dr. Hanan Balki, Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance. We have other colleagues and more colleagues online um, who will join us later in the question and answer session. Now let me hand over to the Director General Dr. Tedros, for the open remarks and for our special guests. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. When COVID-19 emerged almost 16 months ago, we knew that we already had effective tools to prevent infections and save lives in the form of fundamental public health measures. Those measures continue to be the backbone of the response in all countries. But we also knew that we would need new tools. Diagnostics to test for the, this new virus, therapeutics to treat it, and vaccines to prevent it. At the same time, we knew that we live in an inequitable world, a world in which children die from diseases that can be easily prevented with vaccines, and in which people die because their sickness goes undiagnosed and untreated. We knew that unless we took unprecedented action, the world's have-nots would be left behind again. So a year ago, WHO and the many partners who have joined us today came together to launch a unique initiative, the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator was conceived with two aims, the rapid development of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics, and equitable access to those tools. The first objective has been achieved. We now have several safe and effective vaccines to prevent COVID-19. We have rapid diagnostics tests for it. And we have oxygen and dexamethasone to treat it. But we have a long way to go on the second objective. Around the world, people are dying because they are not vaccinated, they are not tested, and they are not treated. We're deeply concerned about their increasing number, the increasing number of cases and deaths in India right now. We know that the situation is complex and requires different responses in different parts of the country. And I welcome the steps the government has taken to reduce social mixing and boost vaccine production. I offer my deep condolences to everyone in India who has lost someone they love, and I offer my deep commitment that WHO and our partners in the ACT Accelerator stand with the government and people of India and will do everything we can to save as many lives as we can. WHO has redeployed 2,600 staff from our other programs on polio, TB, neglected tropical diseases, and immunization programs to support states to respond. We're also providing technical support for the production of oxygen plants and advice on clinical management, including patient triage. 
The situation in India is a devastating reminder of what this virus can do and why we must marshal every tool against it in a comprehensive and integrated approach. Public health measures, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This is a scenario that's playing out around the world and will continue to play out unless we ensure equitable access to the tools needed to save lives. The solution is straightforward. We need countries and companies that control the resources that could save lives to share. That means sharing financial resources to fully fund the ACT Accelerator. It means sharing vaccine doses to protect the most at risk, not just the most rich. It means all countries being transparent about their bilateral dose donations so we know who has what. And it means sharing technology, know-how, and intellectual property to urgently and massively scale up production. The ACT Accelerator needs 19 billion US dollars this year. That's a drop in the ocean compared with the trillions of dollars governments are spending on supporting their economies and the massive revenues that most vaccine makers are generating. It's not good enough to say that inequity is just the way the world is. It's not okay that people just like you and me die when we have the tools that could save them. We cannot accept the same old story. This is the time for all of us to write a new story, a better story that sees nations not as rivals or competitors, but as members of one human family with a common future. Call me an idealist. I will wear that badge with pride. In many ways, that's what the ACT Accelerator is. One family of governments, agencies, civil society, the private sector, philanthropists, and others coming together to find, to find shared solutions to our shared challenge. No one of us can do this alone. Creating the ACT Accelerator was an achievement in itself. But leading it and running it has been an enormous and often unseen task. In September last year, we established a facilitation council led by South Africa and Norway to provide high-level political leadership and advice to facilitate the ACT Accelerator's work. It's now my great honor to welcome His Excellency, President Cyril Ramaphosa, the President of South Africa. Your Excellency, thank you for your outstanding leadership and support for the ACT Accelerator. You have the floor. Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Gabriels, your excellencies and colleagues, and Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, ministers and ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my privilege to be part of this anniversary event for the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. Just over a year ago, on the 24th of April, 2020, we made a commitment to fight the COVID-19 pandemic together as a united front. When we established this collaboration, it was to ensure that 
diagnostics, therapeutics, and indeed vaccines for COVID-19 would be accessible to all. And in the end, we were committed that no country should be left behind. We have indeed come a long way. Since its establishment, the ACT Accelerator has supported the fastest, most coordinated and successful global effort in history to develop tools to fight a disease. We have supported over 70 countries to expand laboratory infrastructure and ramp up testing. Through the Health Systems Connector, we have been able to assess country readiness for vaccine development and deployment in more than 140 countries. We've also established a common knowledge sharing platform where we are able to share each other's experiences. And we've also procured personal protective equipment with a value of more than $500 million. Through COVAX, we have been able to deliver more than 38 million doses of life-saving vaccines to over 100 countries. However, we have a great deal of work to do to ensure equitable access to rapid diagnostics, oxygen, and dexamethasone. This will be done through the therapeutics pillar and the COVID-19 Oxygen Emergency Task Force. We should say that vaccine nationalism seriously threatens the global recovery from the pandemic and is deepening inequality between countries. The COVID-19 vaccine is a public good and must be recognized as such. To overcome challenges with access, low and medium income countries must be supported. Yes, to have access to vaccines, but also to be able to manufacture their own vaccines, diagnostics, and other treatments. As a continent, Africa has embarked on an ambitious drive to work towards the development of pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity so that it can supply the continent's people with the vaccines and other medical supplies they need. To use the existing vaccine manufacturing capacity in developing countries and to enable further development, South Africa and India are calling for a temporary TRIPS waiver to respond to COVID-19. This, in our view, will facilitate the transfer of technology and international property to more countries for the production of COVID-19 vaccines, as well as diagnostics and treatments. We are greatly encouraged by the strong support for the TRIPS waiver proposal from over 100 countries, as well as from 130 civil society organizations, as well as a group of 70 former world leaders and more than 100 Nobel laureates. We welcome the initiative by the World Health Organization to establish a COVID-19 M RNA vaccine technology transfer hub. We call on the pharmaceutical industry to directly transfer this technology free of intellectual property barriers to low and middle income countries through either the WHO hub or the COVAX facility. And we appeal to the international community to help mobilize 
the $19 billion urgently required by ACT Accelerator to implement its 2021 priorities. Just as we worked together to ensure equitable access to medicines to respond to the HIV AIDS pandemic, I think we should work together now, much more so now, largely because COVID-19 has encompassed whole world and affected so many people all at one go around the world. Let us together challenge vaccine nationalism and ensure that protecting intellectual property rights does not come at the expense of human lives. This is all the more pressing as many countries now face a resurgence of infections. As we have done so effectively in the past year, I'd like to believe that we can continue to confront this global health crisis in a spirit of solidarity, in a spirit of partnership as well. Let's face it, it is only through collaboration that we will be able to overcome this devastating pandemic. In my view, there is no other way in which we can confront this pandemic other than working in a collaborative way, in a cooperative way, and standing together instead of standing against each other. Now, ACT Accelerator has enabled us to work so close together in an unprecedented way. Let us take this great lesson for working together forward and be united in everything that we do. I thank you, and this is a great moment to bask in the wonderful work that we have done over a year and prepare ourselves for greater things that lie ahead. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be part of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Your Excellency, and my deep appreciation once again for your exemplary leadership domestically, regionally, and globally. It's now my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Doug Inge Ulstein, the Minister of International Development of Norway. Uh, Minister, thank you for your leadership as co-chair of the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council and for joining us today. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, Excellencies, uh, President Ramaphosa, colleagues, friends. It has been a year full of contradictions, a year of confusion, consternation, competition, and co cooperation. Bad news and worse news have been competing for our attention, but there has indeed been some good news too. The virus has shown to what a degree we all share the same destiny, while also demonstrating dramatic degrees of inequality expanding existing gaps even more. One year ago, we were keeping our fingers crossed that a new vaccine against a new virus could be developed within a year, even if we knew that at least six years was normal. But it happened much sooner. Together, we have managed to turn ACT Accelerator and COVAX into unprecedented mechanisms of international cooperation an unprecedented response to a pandemic without precedent in modern times. Faced with a virus that is totally disrespectful of borders, our fight against it must also cross borders. We all understand this. However, it seems to me somehow as if the leaders of the world still haven't fully woken up to the fact that the coronavirus is capable of crossing borders. Continued lack of financing for the ACT Accelerator poses a major obstacle to its ability to deliver at scale. If we are to bring the pandemic under control, there is an urgent need to close the funding gap of $19 billion. 
A further delay in the funding will cost more lives and even greater economic harm. As long as the pandemic is allowed to prosper in poor countries, it may not just mutate and produce new variants that are dispatched to countries that are already vaccinated, it will also keep the world economy from regaining speed. As co-chairs of ACT Accelerator, President Ramaphosa of South Africa and Prime Minister Solberg of Norway have sent out letters to 89 countries asking them to contribute their fair share. Together with other members of the Facilitation Council, we are actively engaging in bilateral outreach to secure funding. At this one year anniversary, our choice is simple. Invest in saving lives by treating the cause of the pandemic everywhere now, or continue to spend trillions on the consequences of the pandemic with no end in sight. The case for global collaboration couldn't be stronger. As a colleague said in the last Act A meeting, a once in a hundred year event requires a once in a hundred year level response of cooperation and global solidarity. We cannot relax until everyone everywhere has access to vaccines, tests and treatments. The time to act, to accelerate is now. Thank you and over to you again, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. I have enormously valued your leadership and friendship over the past year. And thank you so much again. Since the earliest discussions about the ACT Accelerator and throughout the past year, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has been a steadfast partner. I thank President von der Leyen for her leadership and partnership, and it's my honor to welcome her to make a statement. Dear Dr. Tedros, distinguished guests, I remember very vividly those days of April last year. The world had been caught by surprise by the pandemic, and the response of too many leaders was, my country first. We made a different choice. We knew that we needed to fight this virus not just at home, but in all continents and all countries, from Asia's mega cities to Africa's most remote villages. And for this, we needed to act fast and act together. And this is how the ACT Accelerator was born. I am proud that Europe was part of its inception from day one. And a special thanks to you, dear Dr. Tedros, and the team at WHO for getting the ACT Accelerator off the ground so quickly. And many, many thanks also to you, dear Cyril Ramaphosa and dear Erna Solberg, for taking on the leadership of the Facilitation Council. Already in early May 2020, Europe co-hosted a first pledging conference to raise money for this initiative. Many other pledging events followed suit. Europe helped raise billions of euros for ACT Accelerator, but what I really love about ACT Accelerator is the team spirit. ACT Accelerator wasn't created as a new institution, but a new way of working together. We all mobilized the World Health Organization and national governments, UN agencies and philanthropists, NGOs and the pharma industry because every one of us has something to contribute. ACT Accelerator brought together all health actors and empowered them to do more and better together. Thanks to this cooperation, ACT Accelerator has achieved so much in so little time. ACT Accelerator helped identify a life-saving therapy against COVID. Thanks to ACT Accelerator, COVID tests are now available in low-income countries for less than $3. And its vaccine pillar, COVAX, is now shipping vaccines 
at an affordable price or for free to over 100 countries. None of us could do this alone. But together, we achieved a miracle. Every cent that we put into ACT Accelerator has been a good investment. And we will need more of this in the months ahead. Because the pandemic is far from over, we need ACT Accelerator perhaps even more than one year ago to track the virus as it evolves, to scale up manufacturing, to deliver vaccines to all corners of the world. ACT Accelerator has a funding gap of $22 billion. The European Commission has just doubled its contribution. And let me invite all governments, but also the private sector, to step up. Because this is how we can end the pandemic. Joining forces as a team, as team human. This is the spirit of ACT Accelerator. And Europe is playing for the team. Happy birthday, ACT Accelerator. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, ACT Accelerator. One of the first and most decisive calls we had early last year at the ACT Accelerator was starting to take shape was with President Emmanuel Macron of France. And President Macron has continued to take an active interest and to play an active role in the ACT Accelerator. To mark this first anniversary, we have asked President Macron to reflect on the year that has passed and to look forward to the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. Monsieur le Directeur Général. Director General, dear Dr. Tedros, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, friends. When the pandemic was announced by the World Health Organization in March 2020, I announced that on behalf of France uh, the, and the French people, I would launch an international because the health of our fellow citizens requires international action that is effective. So we cannot allow health systems to collapse. We cannot allow the virus to run out of control across entire regions. The appearance of new variants demonstrated our health also depends upon the poorest countries and all of us here today worked extremely hard to urgently implement a tool that has allowed us to meet this ambition, to give access to products to fight COVID-19 to everyone. It was on the 24th of April 2020, the ACT A Accelerator was launched. One year later, collectively, we can be proud of what we have accomplished. Even though there's a great deal to do, $11 billion have been mobilized. 191 countries have joined the group for the procurement mechanism called COVAX. The volume secured will allow us to reach the target we gave ourselves of vaccinating 20% of the population. I want us to be able to go further, particularly in regards to the African continent. More than 40 million vaccine doses have already been distributed in 114 countries. A few numbers, a few realities that are the first successes of the ACT A initiative launched one year ago now. But now we must continue our efforts to go faster, stronger, because it's a race against time in this pandemic. Today, Despite all the figures I've given, it's still not a satisfactory situation. One person in six has received at least one dose of the vaccine in Europe. One person in five who has received a dose in North America. And alongside that, in Africa, it is less than one in 100. That is unacceptable. There is one very simple response. All states who have purchased uh, COVID can participate. And I would like to say that all those who have pre-ordered vaccines, many vaccines, including France, the European Union, we have a responsibility with regards to the rest of the world. We knew, especially in Europe, when we signed procurement contracts with all the big laboratories, one of our conditions as purchasers was to one day be able to donate or resell our doses. We didn't want to take the risk of depriving the rest of the world of such precious vaccines. Now the time has come to share. 
of course, we have a vaccine campaign, campaign to carry out in each of our countries. Our most vulnerable populations are progressively being covered and we will continue to receive more and more vaccines. And we have the means to accelerate our solidarity by donating vaccines. That's why I am announcing today that France has just sent their first COVAX doses. These AstraZeneca vaccines are going to West Africa now in accordance with the COVAX fair distribution mechanism. Our goal with these donations is to allow all countries, especially in Africa, to vaccinate the priority populations, starting, first of all, with healthcare professionals. This is a commitment that we made together at the G7 summit in February, and we will keep to it by June. Of course, we will share more and more vaccines, at least 500,000 doses by mid-June, with an increasingly diversified basket of vaccines so that we can meet the different challenges of the population. What is essential in this commitment, I think, is that we have made the choice to donate to COVAX. In fact, a vaccine allocation must be based on objective criteria, which only the World Health Organization is able to give us via the COVAX mechanism, and that is its role. And that's why I'm appealing to all my fellow citizens to commit to sharing doses of vaccines. I mentioned a target of 5% in February, but I can already say that we will pass this figure by the end of the year. Then there are many other things that we have to do, but donating vaccines is essential. As countries, we have other ways of improving effective access to all the tools to combat COVID ensuring transparency in procurement contracts so that we can fight against commercial practices which are unfair to more vulnerable countries. The international system today lacks transparency in delivery criteria, conditions, dates, prices. Then, to guarantee that we will mobilise all production facilities for vaccines so that they can be converted throughout the world. No continent should be exclu excluded from the production. It's essential, and this involves licensing agreements and technology transfer. We hear a lot, in fact, about the transfer or lack of intellectual property rights, but we know that's not the issue. The issue is transferring technology and mobilising production capacity, because that's where the bottleneck is. I'm giving a clear message to all vaccine manufacturers to commit to such a process. Global access is our collective responsibility. Countries, international organisations have an essential role to play, and so does the private sector. So we must all cooperate with the medicine patent pool to identify underused production capacity, to maximise and accelerate the transfer of technology, and allow the production of more doses of this valuable vaccine. Then vaccination is essential, but in order to be effective, it must be supported, first of all, by an improvement in our diagnosis and sequencing capacity so we can track and combat, combat variants. I want to highlight the exceptional work carried out by the African CDC, supported by AFD and our research institute and the PERS Pasteur Institute network. This project will improve the work against the pandemic in Africa, protect the most vulnerable and guide procurement choices for vaccines. Vaccine must also be accompanied by structural movement to strengthen healthcare systems, which is the cornerstone of all methods of fighting the pandemic. And we have to come out of this crisis f stronger. It's a central prior priority for me, and the French Development Agency has committed subs significant amounts, and we've just approved another billion euros to help healthcare systems combat COVID. The World Health Assembly on the 21st of May, with its summit, will facilitate the recording of all our meeting points on this issue. We must meet today's challenges to find a collective response and we must also build 
on this unprecedented situation and learn all the lessons to change the global healthcare system. It must be more robust, inclusive and more effective to deal with future pandemics. A reformed, strengthened World Health Organization must be the cornerstone. Many things are being decided today. The credibility itself of multilateralism in the area of health is being decided today in our capacity to rapidly deliver vaccines in the field in Latin America and South America and Africa, in the Pacific as well. It's up to us. And so I'm counting on each of us. We will be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency President Macron. And thank you to you and France for your generous don donation to COVAX. I hope other countries will soon follow your example. The strength of the ACT Accelerator is that it has been supported strongly by governments all over the world. Now it's my honor to introduce three leaders who have been unwavering in their support. Prime Minister Mario Draghi of Italy, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, and President Pedro Sanchez of Spain. Dear Director General, dear colleagues, the pandemic has shown us the importance of international collaboration in the realm of public health. Viruses and infectious diseases know no borders. COVID-19 quickly spread from China to the rest of the world and has claimed so far at least three million lives globally. Regrettably, our initial response lacked coordination. The global community failed to share information promptly and adequately. We struggled to understand that what was happening to another country would quickly happen to us too. Global threats require global responses. We will not be completely safe until all countries are safe. The ACT Accelerator, born a year ago, is an excellent example of what we can achieve when we work together. It aims to support the development and equitable distribution of the tests, treatments, and vaccines needed to bring the pandemic under control. It treats global health for what it really is, a public good. This is why, since its inception, Italy has been amongst its strongest supporters and main contributors. We now see an end to the worst of this pandemic. Thanks to global cooperation, scientists have developed a number of effective vaccines that can save lives and help us return to a normal life. But this success cannot be a source of complacency. We have to be more ambitious. We need to scale up research and development to fight new variants. We need to strengthen our health systems. We need to ensure equitable access to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines also in low-income countries. This year, Italy holds the presidency of the G20, Overcoming the pandemic and ensuring a sustainable and resilient recovery are at the heart of our agenda. We have emphasized the role of the accelerator in fostering global immunization according to transparent agreed rules. We want to scale up the capability of the COVAX facility to achieve equitable distribution of safe and effective vaccines. Thank you. Excellencies, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you in marking this first anniversary of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and commend Dr. Tedros and the WHO for leading this important response to the global pandemic. 
For many developing countries, the ACT accelerator has been the only way to access life-saving COVID-19 testing kits, vaccines, and treatment. As the pandemic continues to evolve, often in an unpredictable manner, much more needs to be done to remove barriers to affordability and equitable distribution. In particular, Africa lags behind in the manufacture of vital products for COVID-19 prevention and management. Efforts are underway to build this capacity, but this requires support across the board to ensure that it's done properly and quickly enough to make a difference in the ongoing pandemic and improve preparedness for the next one. Rwanda remains committed to the goals of the ACT Accelerator. By now, there are lessons to learn in order to make this effort more effective. We will continue to work together with the WHO and other partners to defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you. This is an unprecedented and new innovation from ACT, working through diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And it was a major emergency. Most of Europe was confined to a greater or lesser extent. In Spain, it was very strict, and the number of deaths was enormous. A year later, we have some reasons for hope and in some countries we are seeing a lesser extent to the impact of the virus thanks to the vaccinations which are underway we are better organized and we're more aware of what we have to do but we also know we cannot let down our guard in these 365 days act accelerator has played a an essential role in looking at the best responses for combating COVID-19. Act A has allowed states and international organizations to join together with no hierarchy to face this challenge and to work in solidarity. And it has worked. And secondly, as a mechanism for the collection of funds and for the sharing out to those who most need it and also to attracting the private sector and other types of organizations such as regional and global banks and thirdly as a way of sharing lessons learned and working together the ACT however long it has been in place is has been timeless in the way it operates it has been a matter of pride for us to co-lead this initiative and to participate in the Facilitation Council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. And we now we move uh, to uh, the UN. As you know, WHO is proud uh, to play a role in ACT Accelerator but we have only done so as part of the United Nations and with its support. It's now my honor to introduce Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Director General, Dr. Tedros, my brother, Excellencies, distinguished guests, the ACT Accelerator has been a critical multilateral instrument in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is saving lives, it is enabling societies and economies to begin the job of recovery, and it is giving us hope. As we mark the ACT Accelerator's first anniversary, it is sobering to look back at the devastating impact of this crisis. COVID-19 has taken more than 3 million lives. It has infected more than 140 million people all over the world, and the virus continues to rage. The pandemic has revealed stark, wide-ranging global fragilities and disparities, including in access to COVID-19 tools, treatments, and vaccines. 
If we are to successfully combat the pandemic and halt its impact on health and economies, greater global solidarity is crucial. We need coordinated investments in research and development, stepped up production and widespread deployment of effective vaccines, diagnostics and treatments to all regions and countries. That is why the ACT Accelerator was created. One year on, we see its positive impact. This extraordinary partnership has delivered through COVAX more than 40 million doses of life-saving vaccines to 118 participants since its first international delivery to Ghana in February this year. It also secured millions of treatment courses and diagnostic kits for low- and middle-income countries. Yet, vast challenges remain. Vaccine nationalism is hindering COVAX access, slowing distribution of vaccines to the poorest and the most vulnerable. We have seen an unprecedented mobilization of resources for multiple donors, which has raised $14.1 billion for the ACT Accelerator. Yet, $19 billion is still needed to fully finance it for 2021. I call on countries to join this effort and to fully fund the ACT Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator cannot fulfill its mandate without the support of all countries. Let's also recognise that a full and truly sustainable recovery also requires us to get on track to reach the Sustainable Development Goals and achieve universal health coverage. The entire United Nations system has mobilised in support of governments around the world for a response and recovery. We are committed to working together with all partners to make the ACT Accelerator a success for all people. Thank you. As I said earlier, the strength of the ACT Accelerator is its wide support from governments all over the world. I'm now pleased to introduce video messages that have been sent by Gail Smith, the global COVID-19 coordinator from the United States of America, Karina Gold, the Minister of International Development of Canada, and Mikhail Murashko, the Minister of Health of the Russian Federation. Greetings. I'm so honored to be here today with heads of state, esteemed guests, partners, and most importantly, the founders of ACT Day. On behalf of President Biden, we congratulate you on this important day, your one year anniversary. Our message to you is one of thanks. Thank you for coming together to build a platform that is enabling us to build a global response to this global pandemic. We are strong partners of ACT Day and intend to continue to be your partners, expressed not only in the substantial financial contributions we've been able to make recently, but also as we gather the learnings from this first year and based on the facts, the evidence and the data, increase our impact and effectiveness. Partners, as we champion the cause of global public health and build a world where every country can prevent, detect, and respond to these kinds of global health threats. Partners, as we reach out to other donors and enlist them in this fight. So from all of us on this day, our congratulations and our thanks. You have a partner in the United States. Thank you. Years ago, we had to confront a virus which does not respect any borders and which dragged the world into an unprecedented crisis. All countries need tests, treatments and vaccines against COVID-19 and all countries must protect their citizens and stop the spread of the virus. All countries must stop the emergence of new variants which could scupper world progress. Depends on the health of everyone, everywhere. That is why Canada has been committed to the ACT Accelerator from the start. Because the success of ACT Day is our best exit strategy from this pandemic. This unprecedented global collaboration has made remarkable progress, 
with WHO approved vaccines reaching more than 100 countries in less than a year's time, with rapid test kits rolled out around the world, and with therapies old and new saving lives and reducing suffering. This is monumental success. It is multilateralism at its best, rising to the global challenge. But now is not the time to let up our efforts. We must bring this response to scale and do so across each ACT pillar. This will ensure truly global access to safe and effective vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, while strengthening the health systems to deliver them. Together, we need to reach every country. We need to support fragile health systems so vaccines get into people's arms, because as the saying goes, it's not vaccines that save people, it's vaccinations. We need to ensure this response reaches every person, especially the most vulnerable at risk of being left behind. I am proud to represent Canada on the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council and to serve as co-chair of the COVAX AMC Engagement Group. I am proud that Canada has committed $940 million to this collaboration and more than $3 billion to the overall response. But so much more is needed and Canada will play its part. Le moment est venu de nous... The time has come to mobilize and to support the excellent organizations which are partners of ACT Accelerator. Everyone must make their fair share of effort in this. There's everyone. It is the only way we can defeat this pandemic. We must act now and we must act together. Civil society organizations play a vital role the ACT Facilitation Initiative, we can note that this has become a truly global initiative which has strengthened trust between countries around the world and international organizations in efforts to create and manufacture and carefully spread vaccines and medications. I congratulate all participants on the results achieved. We welcome the COVAX initiative, which is now reaching the long-awaited delivery targets for countries with low and middle income. I believe our main task is to ensure equitable global access to vaccines and that this will soon be achieved. We express our willingness to extend cooperation with the ACT-A initiative, with international platforms, to achieve our goals. At this difficult time, Russia remains true to its commitments at the G20, at the WHO, and will continue to contribute to global efforts to fight the pandemic. We are coordinating international efforts to combat this pandemic within the BRICS, SCO, CIS, and on a bilateral level, we have registered the Sputnik V vaccine in more than 16 countries around the world. And we are scaling up our production in foreign countries. We are also conducting vaccination of diplomatic personnel in Moscow. We have made voluntary contributions to several UN agencies. Distinguished colleagues, turning around this COVID-19 situation will only be possible through joint efforts. We hope that the ACT-A initiative will be further strengthened and will continue to function well for the good of the entire world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And civil society organizations play a vital role in every, health, in every area of health, holding leaders to account, providing technical expertise, delivering services, and giving voice to their communities. The ACT Accelerator is no exception. And it's now my honor to introduce Peter Ngola Owiti from, from Kenya, who is a civil society representative on the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council. One year ago, we came together to form Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. But much more still needs to be done. 
To avoid more deaths, excess vaccines must be donated or sold to low- and middle-income countries. Vaccine manufacturing facilities should be accelerated in Rwanda, Senegal, and the Republic of South Africa. Rapid antigen tests must be provided for broad use in low- and middle-income countries, the same way that the Global North is using them. There is urgent need to tackle the oxygen crisis, particularly in India and Africa. Civil societies and communities should be supported and provided with enabling environment to meaningfully respond to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics would not exist at all without the private sector companies who develop and produce them. It's now my pleasure to welcome Thomas Cooney, the Director General of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, to be followed by John Denton, the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce. In joining ACT Day last year, the biopharmaceutical industry signed up to bring to this partnership a unique expertise in the discovery, development, and large scale manufacturing of medicines and vaccines. A year later, we can say science wins. Not one, but several highly effective vaccines have been developed at record speed that are now produced in historic quantities. As partners of ACT A, we committed to accelerate global access to safe, effective, and affordable COVID 19 treatments and vaccines. To make this happen, we are seeing unprecedented partnerships between vaccine manufacturers from developing and industrialized countries. Yes, we have had setbacks. Some vaccine projects failed, bumps and hitches in scaling up manufacturing, and we know the world needs to do better in walking to talk on vaccine equity. However, we are still witnessing the fastest vaccine rollout ever. To end the pandemic, we must continue this journey together. Good day. My name is John Denton. I'm the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, the institutional representative of 45 million businesses worldwide. At the ICC, we have supported the ACT or ACT Accelerator since its inception as only a truly global, inclusive and collaborative response will stop the spread of COVID and minimise its economic damage. Not only is that the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. The longer it takes for us to control COVID everywhere, the greater the suffering and lives lost. Businesses shuttered, societies frayed, and nations divided. We have shown that the economic cost alone of vaccine nationalism, of failing to quickly distribute vaccines to all countries, no matter how rich they are, could amount to up to $9 trillion. Yes, that's right, $9 trillion. And the longer we wait to find the remaining $25 billion or so for the ACT Accelerator, the more these costs will grow. That is why we at the ICC believe the ACT Accelerator remains, on its first birthday, not only great health policy, but also the best possible jab in the arm for the global economy. With high effectiveness, zero side effects, and even potential to stop the spread of protectionist policies that would hamper a much needed economic recovery. Vaccine early, vaccine and accelerate. Thank you so much to all our speakers today. As I said in my opening remarks, the ACT Accelerator is a unique partnership that has involved the participation of nine global health organizations, working together to build something that's truly much more than the sum of its parts. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the leaders of each of our partners, Seth Berkeley from Gavi, Philip Denton from UnitAid, Chris Elias from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Henrietta Ford from UNICEF, Emma Hane from FIND, Richard Hatchett from SEPI, Mohamed Pate from the World Bank, Peter Sands from the Global Fund, and Carl Bild, our special envoy for the ACT Accelerator and co-chair of the group and the former Prime Minister of Sweden. 
Thank you all. Thank you all of you for your leadership and partnership. And I look forward to our continued collaboration in the months ahead as we work together to stop infections, save lives, and end the pandemic. Christian, back to you. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Tedros. Happy birthday, ACT Accelerator. Um, before we head into the question and answer session um, with these ACT principles and leads as just introduced, we'll show you a quick clip on the 12 months of the ACT Accelerator. See you in a moment. World leaders launched a global solution to rapidly end the pandemic and equip countries to fight this devastating virus. The ACT Accelerator has secured more than 60 million COVID-19 tests, over $500 million worth of equipment to keep health workers safe, and nearly 3 million doses of the proven COVID-19 treatment, dexamethasone. COVAX has delivered more than 40 million vaccines to over 100 countries and economies, and ACT Accelerator-supported research continues to find the next generation of tools. But the pandemic isn't over. Societies and economies are still suffering. Our safety and security is still at risk. And history is still in the making. It's time to recommit to act together. Let's take research, production, and distribution up a gear to keep everyone, everywhere, safe from COVID-19. Welcome back. Let me now open the floor to questions from the media. To get into the queue, please, uh, for to ask questions, please raise your hand with the raise your hand icon on your screen. Um, and we would be happy, of course, to get as many questions for our special guests. We'll start with the first on my screen, and that's Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie? Oh, I'm very sorry, wrong here. This is Jamil Shad from Progresso. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, Christian. Um, is the presence zero Ramaphosa still uh, available for questions? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, we'll have the uh, principles available as just briefly introduced by Dr. Tedros. Sure. Um, then uh, uh, my question is to Dr. Tedros, basically. Um, if he allows, uh, you have called this an outrage, the fact that it was not distributed as fast as, uh, as uh, uh, it was envisaged. Uh, do you think that it has been enough what we have seen, or is it still long to go? And also this week you had a meeting with the new foreign minister of Brazil. What was your message to him? Thank you, sir. We'll start with, the, with Dr. Aylward for the first part. Oh, Seth Beckley, so, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Berkeley, great if you could start with the first part. Dr. Seth Berkeley from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance, please. Well, well, thank you for the question. Of course, the answer is, um, um, although we are very excited, as you've heard, that we've started delivering now to 118 countries, more than 40 million doses, um, and also we've seen the millions of tests and diagnostics secured, this is not enough. And um, we have to do much more. We need to um, have uh, the global supply to increase um, dramatically. This is going to require another paradigm shift to more manufacturing, including further voluntary tech transfers to boost production, particularly in and for emerging economies. We've heard that now theme multiple times. And we need more countries to donate vaccines because um, there is a limit to how many one can purchase on the open market. Um, we, we really were very happy to and want to thank President Macron for his leadership with today's announcement of France donating uh, to COVAX to be distributed equitably to lower income countries where they're needed most. I warmly welcome that and, and um, really feel that, um, you know, hopefully we'll hear from other leaders uh, similar action and urge them to do so. 
And I would just say that, um, you know, we also heard the important point with the virus raging out of control in parts of the world and more and more new variants appearing, collective action and commitment to equity remains our only hope for the pandemic to end. So um, we're only safe if everyone is safe. And I want to, since this is the first time I'm speaking, I want to say happy birthday to my dear colleagues. So a longer answer to the answer, no, not enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke, and Dr. Elbert Ted, please. Thank you very much, Christian and Jamil. Thank you for the question. We had an excellent conversation with the, uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Brazil, earlier this week. Um, appreciated everything that was being done now to step up the response, ensure the right measures are in place to slow down the crisis there. We spoke also about the important work being done in Brazil to escalate the production of vaccines, some of the challenges they were facing inside the country, and uh, how we might be able to help in terms of ensuring the continued supply of raw materials and other materials that were needed. In the course of that, we appreciated as well the commitment from the foreign minister and the government of Brazil to not only be escalating production for Brazil, but they were also looking um, forward beyond the crisis uh, currently faced in the country to how they might help uh, the rest of the world as well with vaccines as they scale production, reach their own populations, or are able to do more. And then finally, the role of COVAX was appreciated, and especially the work that's ongoing to escalate deliveries to all countries, um, especially those hard hit like Brazil, as we go forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. And we'll come to Pretty Patnaik from Geneva. Pretty, please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, this is a question for, for Dr. Tidros or Dr. Mike Ryan. Um, you've often said that WHO cannot criticize member states in public. But we are wondering if you will make a statement on the elections, political rallies, and religious gatherings um, in the midst of the surge in India, um, and whether WHO had praised India a bit too soon. And as a consequence, what is the plan B for COVAX in the context of the Indian challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much, Priti. And I'll look at Dr. Mike Ryan, who also joined us. Uh, the Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. Dr. Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, and uh, Sumi Swamanatha may be in line as well, if they wish to make a comment. We've been in very close contact with our regional office and our country office in supporting India in what is a very complex uh, situation there. This is not easy for anyone who have a uh, disease that has rapidly spread. Multiple factors have driven that's uh, acceleration in cases. It is a very difficult task, both to reduce the force of infection by having um, people adapt their behavior, not always easy in the situations that people find themselves in in India, but we've got to reduce mobility, we've got to reduce mixing in whatever way we can to reduce the force of infection. The Indian government are moving to do that. Uh, there's been a huge focus on increasing uh, COVID management and triage, and uh, the Indian government has been scaling up oxygen production, working very, very closely with the uh, UNDP and UNICEF and others, and we've offered help and assistance in clinical management and triage and in, in, in scaling up oxygen supplies as, as needed. Um, the uh, India is a very, as you know, large, populous country, complex, different situations, different epidemiologic situations in different states. Unfortunately, we lost Dr. Ryan there. Yeah, managing uh, public health threats. Dr. Ryan, we lost you for a moment. Please come back if there's more. Okay. Um, Oops, now I muted him. Hold on for a second. Quick technical issue. Can we try again? Yes, please, Dr. Ryan. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Christian, where did you lose me? Um, I think when he spoke about Complex oxygen. Complex issue, multiple states. Yeah, just as he started with the oxygen, correct, yeah. Yeah, no, just recognizing the role that our colleagues, uh, sister agencies, UNDP and UNICEF, have played in supporting oxygen uh, scale up in India. But the Indian government are moving very fast to scale up oxygen supply. We're providing technical assistance and clinical management and triaging of patients. That's really key now. We've got to save lives. We've got to have rational use of these measures, not hoarding 
the patients who need oxygen, the patients who need uh, clinical care need to get it. Uh, there's a lot of fear in, in, in India right now, and, and the government are trying to bring calm, they're trying to bring an orderly approach. The states are doing the same. The situation is not the same in all the states. Some states are facing a much more serious situation than others. So we support the government of India, like we support all governments, in, fi in, 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 in facing this really, really difficult situation. It is difficult. It is not the time for recriminations. It's the time for solidarity. It's the time to move quickly together to reduce deaths, to reduce transmission by decreasing mobility and mixing, by supporting communities and mask wearing and where they can in, in, in maintaining social uh, distance and in reducing the amount of gatherings that are occurring that are driving transmission as well. This is not easy in the context of India. It's not easy in the context of any state, especially one as populous as India. So I think this is the time to show solidarity and support for what the Indian government are trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, and I believe Dr. Berkeley might have something to add, Seth, from the Gavi Alliance. Um, yes, I, I, will, I, I will just say that um, we, of course, have been uh, working closely with India on vaccine provision. The first 10 million doses of, of uh, from COVAX went um, to India. Uh, we've supported the scale up of multiple vaccines now that are uh, that are being produced in India. Of course, it is a very difficult time. And one of the challenges we've had to try to work with is how one balances the acute needs for India, where there's a very large population, but the needs for many other countries that rely on India as uh, one of the vaccine manufacturers for the world. And that's something that we've been trying to balance working with the manufacturers there and the government there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkeley. We'll move to the next question, and that's uh, Abdallah Wassan from Morocco. Abdallah, please unmute yourself. Good afternoon. I thank you for giving me the floor. My question is as follows. I would like to know what is the percentage of aid given to Morocco through the COVAX scheme? And what are your plans to allow countries with limited income to achieve greater vaccination? I think we just uh, heard the rest of the translation. Um, could I ask Seth Berkeley again from the Vaccine Alliance, please? So um, thank you for that um, question. Um, uh, of course, um, Morocco is part of uh, the COVAX effort and is um, supported as one of the advanced market commitment countries. And and so it will be receiving doses as as part of that um, in terms of its numbers, um, the numbers that it is expected to receive um, have been posted on our website. Um, there is a slight delay in um, the supplies from the manufacturer that Morocco is is receiving, um, but those will be uh, coming in the next few months. And for Dr. Elwood, to add, please. Yeah, and just in terms of the number of the amount that's, uh, that's already scheduled, um, over a third of that, about 300,000 doses, have already been shipped out. Uh, and again, as, as Seth said, hoping to accelerate the rest of that over the next two months. Thank you for these clarifications. We'll move on to Jeremy Lange from RFE. Jeremy, please, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to have a, a few, the latest information about the the CTAP and the um, MPP um, uh, disposal of uh, WHO. Uh, is any manufacturer uh, uh, actually uh, joined uh, the, the CTAP and the MPP so far? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. We'll give this to Dr. Simao, Mariangela Simao, if online. Thank you. Thank you very much, 
Jeremy, we do have, a, we are in negotiations with four manufacturers for diagnostics, and this is on an ongoing process. So far, we have approached different manufacturers for vaccines and also the, the potential manufacturers for uh, uh, small molecules, uh, the pharmaceuticals, but have not been successful in that extent as well. But let me, I think we have the colleague from the, the director from the Medicines Patent Pool, and he can give a, a, an overview from the Medicines Patent Pool itself, because I believe they, they have some news on their side. It's Charles Gore online. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sumia, and thank you for the question. Uh, just like to say that, uh, to um, restate what Sum Dr. Sumia said, that uh, at the moment we have, we're not in a position to uh, actually get a license, but we are in discussions with a, a number of, uh, a number of com uh, companies. But what is important, I think, is what uh, President Macron said that we really need to encourage more companies to come forward to enter into discussions to see how we could uh, help in the response to um, COVID. Because, as you know, the medicines patent pool was set up for another health emergency, HIV, and that allowed us to uh, address that by increasing the number of manufacturers across the world through transparent licensing and non-exclusive licenses that allowed a very broad geographic manufacturing base, things that we need for COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this was uh, Charles Gore from the Medicines Patent Pool, MPP. And before we had Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General from for access to medicines and health products at WHO. Next question goes to John Saracostas from The Lancet. John, please unmute yourself. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, I was wondering, uh, going forward, uh, if uh, some of the experts uh, on the panel have any out-of-the-box ideas on how to really ramp up global vaccine production. There have been some successful models in history, like in World War II with the penicillin production, where the cooperation between the US government and pharmaceutical companies managed to produce up to 650 billion units per month. So is there a chance for a new model? Thank you very much, John. I'd like to start with Dr. Richard Hatchett from SIPI and possibly followed by Dr. Henrietta, uh, Ms. Henrietta Four from UNICEF. So, Dr. Hatchett, please. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Hatchett. Sorry, Dr. Hatchett, we have no sound right now. Let me try start with Ms. Four from UNICEF, um, Executive Director first, and otherwise we try you again, sorry. Ms. Four, please. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm responding to an earlier question, <clears throat> which came from the gentleman from Morocco, <clears throat> on what we are doing to help other countries. So I just wanted to mention that as an alliance, um, coal chain in country, so solar powered refrigerators, the training of healthcare workers, the help in getting uh, um, vaccines out into the countryside by every possible means and to get the community workers to carry a sense of trust so that people feel good about getting a vaccination and that vaccines move from the tarmac into the arms of the people who need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Four. And we'll try again uh, for Dr. Hatchett from SIPI if we have a better sound now. Oh dear, unfortunately not. Um, very sorry for that, Dr. Hatchett, and for all who can't hear this now, we'll possibly try it again Chris, later. Do you, want me to, oh. do you want me to say something at Seth? Yes, please, go ahead. 
Yeah, so you're absolutely right. We do need a spectacular increase in volume of production. The world produces somewhere around four to five billion doses, and what we're talking about is a tripling or quadrupling of production. The first priority, which I know Richard would have talked about, is right now we're seeing supply constraints, and that is stopping vaccine production right now. For example, we know of one company that has over 20,000 liters of production capacity, but they have not been able to produce vaccines because they don't have the raw materials and equipment they need to do that. The second thing that's critical is making sure that everybody who has the ability to produce vaccine is part of this. And CEPI is, as part of the COVAX Manufacturing Task Force, reaching out to all manufacturers on the world now to relook at what the capacity is now. They did this a year ago, but things have changed so much to see are there additional places to go. And the last issue will be, of course, trying to uh, move into new capacity development. Of course, that takes more time, but there is an active discussion um, on, on how that might be done to move forward. So it is a very important part of what we do. Of course, we don't know, will we need boosters because of waning immunity? Will we need new vaccines because of variants? Will we need boosters for variants? So regardless of any of those three issues, we will need more vaccines. So. Um, uh, we're all looking, working together to try to see how we can get there as quickly as possible. Over. Thank you very much. And this was Dr. Seth Berkeley from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. Um, Dr. Emma Hennay from FIND wanted to add on the diagnostics. Dr. Hennay, please. Uh, no, there was nothing else from, from my end to add on those questions so far. Sorry for the misunderstanding, and um, I'm asking um, Dr. Philip Dunton from Unitaid uh, if he wanted to ask. No, I don't see anything. Then we move on to the next question, um, and that would be Anna Danaya from Anna Danaya Usher from Development Today. Anna, please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask about the funding situation of the ACT Accelerator. What exactly, first of all, is the funding gap? Uh, different figures were mentioned by different speakers today, 19 billion, 22 billion. Uh, and my second question is that the original Act A budget of 38 billion assumed a 20% coverage of therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines. What what is your estimate of what it would cost on top of the 38 billion to increase the coverage uh, of, of these various tools to say 50% or 75%, especially? for the lowest income countries who are wholly reliant on this mechanism. Um, what is your estimate and do you see a need to increase the ask of the ACT Accelerator from the current 38 billion? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start with Dr. Uh, no, Peter Sands from the Global Fund. Uh, to go ahead with this, and then we'll go back to Dr. Aylward here in, in the room. Dr. S Mr. Sands, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very good question. Um, if I could start with um, what the numbers are now. Um, we started with 38 billion. We have both raised money, um, and we have revised our estimates as the year has unfolded because we've learned a lot about the pricing and the dynamics of the different tools. The current unfunded gap for the ACT Accelerator is $19 billion. And before I talk about your other question about what would it take to do it even more, um, I just think it's worth reflecting very quickly on the fact that well, I don't want to diminish the achievements of the ACT Accelerator. We're part of it and proud to be part of it over the last 12 months. The reality is the world would be in a better position 
if we had actually succeeded in getting that 38 billion roughly 12 months ago, we would have more manufacturing capacity for vaccines, more countries would have received the tests they need to be able to run test and trace strategies and contain transmission. We would be further down the road of developing innovative therapeutics. And we would have done a better job in protecting the frontline health workers who put their lives at risk every day in fighting the pandemic. So even before we think about what we need to do to achieve more, we should reflect on the fact that that 19 billion we need right now, we don't want to be in 12 months saying the same as I've just said, that we would be in a better position had we got that money. Uh, to your question, um, there's a lot of work going on um, across the different pillars to revise the estimates and look, as we look further into the second half of 21 and into 22, what we would need to do to achieve higher rates of coverage of vaccines, higher rates of testing. At the moment, the estimates um, uh, are only based on bringing lower middle income countries up to about 20% of the rate of high income countries, which is probably not enough. And also with the hope and expectation that we do get better treatments to fund broad scale um, deployment um, of those. That is gonna be a pretty big number. Um, I, 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 I don't have that number, but it's gonna be uh, of the order of double the, the 19 billion. Um, but the first thing we need to do before we get too excited about what that next phase is, is to make sure we get the 19 billion now and help countries deliver the kind of comprehensive strategy they need to beat this pandemic. It's a total false economy not to do that. Over. Thank you very much. This was Peter Sands, the executive director for the Global Fund. And moving to Dr. Aylward to add. No, Dr. Sands uh, laid it out nicely. That's $19 billion is the current gap. Absolutely crucial that it gets closed in the near term because every day that we miss, people are not getting tested in countries where they have to be tested. As a result, people are not getting isolated who have the disease, and people are dying, as you're reading about in the newspapers and seeing in the media every day, because we can't get enough oxygen, dexamethasone out there. And of course, as we speak about every day in these conferences, the funds simply aren't there to get the PPE, even in, um, where it needs to be, as well, of course, as the vaccines. Thank you very much, Dr. Elmer, and Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the things that we've been discussing that we could do with increased funding that in retrospect didn't go as well as the vaccines development have gone is, is on the antivirals. And this has traditionally been a weak area. If you look at the investment that went into vaccine development just in the first year, it's probably around $20 billion or so globally from the public sector and the private sector. We didn't see that kind of investment in therapeutics. And early on, there was too much reliance on um, unproven remedies. You know, the clinical trials were just starting. Focus was on repurposed drugs followed by monoclonal antibodies. And we still haven't got any antivirals, though we're seeing some promising developments on antivirals. So I think increased investments in the ACT accelerator, in the therapeutics pillar, would enable us to develop broad spectrum antivirals, which would help not only this pandemic, but also be a safeguard against future pandemics. And it is possible. I think the same kind of investments, the same kind of collaborations between the private and the public sector that we saw in vaccine development. We need newer uh, versions of broader spectrum monoclonals that can be delivered subcutaneously, intramuscularly. We need inhaled drugs. And again, we're seeing promising developments with a, a variety of inhaled uh, substances that can be used in early management and early treatment to prevent people from deteriorating and getting into hospitals. So those are the kind of investments because we know this infection isn't going away very, anytime very soon. And we will have to continue to, to manage people who get infected in addition to preventing the infection through uh, vaccination. So investments in R&D, in innovation, 
extremely important in addition to ramping up production, manufacturing capacity, and delivery systems. Thank you. Thank you so much for these add-ons. And I see uh, Ms. Henrietta Four from UNICEF, Executive Director, has her hand up too. Uh, Ms. Four, please come in. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to add in an area on which we've been working hard but have not done enough as a world, which is primary health care. If we can have running water and a bar of soap, good hygiene, community clinics and hospitals and in schools worldwide, this also will help. But as the world have not paid enough attention to this area. And the last area is community work. They are the backbone of any system for vaccination. And we have been using the generous support of the Gates Foundation, of Rotary, of many others with WHO and all of us who are out in the field. It is because of those community workers that we are able to get the vaccinations across, but we could use strengthening and investment in these systems as a world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Four. And I'm looking at uh, Dr. Philip Dunton from Unitaid. Philip, please unmute yourself. Thank you and good afternoon. And just to reinforce that was said by Sumia, uh, it's important to recognize that there are three things to be done uh, in terms of therapeutics. And if we want to control a disease, we need to prevent with vaccine and PPE, but also to, um, to do more in case management with uh, new therapeutics. Uh, first, we need to use what is available and show efficacy in terms of access to oxygen, dexamethasone, anticoagulant. And this is absolutely key. And we have a partnership with uh, the WHO, UNICEF and Global Fund, World Bank to assess and support the country. There is a clear need to help the country to have technical assistance um, and funding. And uh, we believe that uh, it's absolutely key. The second point is that we have in the pipeline some um, promising uh, potential new drugs, uh, antivirals and, and uh, monoclonal antibody, which uh, we believe that we will have the readout in clinical trials uh, by, uh, by the fall this year. So we need to prepare ourselves. And I just want to highlight the need to have a broader view in terms of access. Access should be for all the countries because the fight is uh, to be done at country level. In each country, there is a strong battle and we need to help them. And the last point to reinforce what was said by Sumia is the fact that there is an uh, unfunded uh, agenda to do more in terms of therapeutic, globally speaking. And there are new campaigns that need to be uh, assessed so there is a huge effort to be done. It's a global effort. It's ACTA and uh, several partners that need to put uh, resources into that. Over to you. Thank you so much for all your contributions. And we'll move to Namrata from Forbes India. Uh, Namrata, please unmute yourself. Namrata, do you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, this is a question for the ACT leadership. Uh, considering that uh, in India, there is an already, <clears throat> already an, I'm sorry, already an ongoing election process, how would they advise the uh, stakeholders to go ahead from now, like from tomorrow? What should be done to halt the spike? Or slow it down. Thank you. I'm not quite sure if we understood your question right um, about this, uh, the ongoing spike in India, correct? And the elections, I think yes, the elections we covered the before. Ongoing election process. The elections, yeah. I think we covered before, but uh, I'll ask Dr. Mike Ryan, WHO um, Executive Director on Health Emergencies, again to clarify on the, on the situation with the spike in India. Okay. Yes, um, yeah, clearly there's been, uh, you know, and you've all seen the data, there's been a very large spike in India. And as I said, that's affecting a number of states, but not equally affecting all states. The Indian government uh, and scientists there know full well how uh, we've learned a lot in the last year. We all know how to reduce spikes. This spike has been driven by a range of factors, increased mobility, the emergence of variants, 
um, uh, and, and, and many other things. Uh, you halt the spike by going back and doing the things that need to be done. Unfortunately, it's quite a challenge in a country like India. Um, lockdowns and, 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 and uh, very, very harsh lockdowns are very difficult to implement. They're very difficult to sustain. People have to work. They have to live. Um, so you have to find ways to reduce mobility and to reduce mixing of people in, in the most, um, in the most, uh, in the smartest way possible. Um, uh, providing more masks for people, providing more access to good quality masks, very, very important to reduce uh, infection rates, um, and ensuring that people can get into clinical care as quickly as as possible. The, the steps are 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 clear. The difficulty is in the implementation. Uh, and implementing all of these measures uh, to reduce infection, to decrease fatality in, in, a, in a clinical setting, uh, to increase uh, immunization. Uh, that is what needs to happen. Uh, it is difficult uh, to achieve, and the implementation of that will be different in different states across India. Uh, and, and again, I would say that the government of India and the governments at state level have good scientists, good public health people. They know what they need to do. The issue is getting the cooperation of people, getting the cooperation of government, getting everybody's cooperation to work together to drive the infection rates down. It is not an easy task with this intensity of transmission. And as I said before, we all have to work to support our colleagues in India and support the people of India in order to achieve that. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ryan. We are slowly coming to the end of our question and answer session. The, the way we will do now is I will ask first Dr. Richard Hatchett from CEPI because it seems his uh, connection is working again. And then we'll come all around to our uh, special guests, the ACT A principals, for a round of uh, closing remarks. And I'll go alphabetically and start with Dr. Berkeley. Um, but for now, we'll go ahead with Dr. Richard Hatchett, uh, if there's anything to add, what you couldn't add before. Sure, can you, can you, can you hear me better this time? Well, wonderful, please go ahead. Good, sorry, sorry for the technical challenge earlier. Just to respond to the earlier question, uh, Seth spoke to many of the important points and the efforts of the manufacturing task force that we've stood up under COVAX to really look at all elements of uh, manufacturing to see what we can we can accelerate both through the supply chain, um, through expanding existing manufacturing efforts and, and through technology transfer. Peter uh, referred to you know the opportunity that was missed last year in terms of making investments and scaling up manufacturing capacity. I think we need to reflect on that and 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 you know take that as a lesson learned. Uh, we we clearly need ultimately need not only to worry about equitable distribution of vaccine, but equitable distribution of vaccine manufacturing capability. And I think uh, that is one of the great challenges that, that we will face as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Hatchett. With this, we'll go into a round of closing comments. And again, I'll start with my alphabetical list here. And we we'll start with Dr. Seth Berkeley. Chief Executive Officer of, of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Seth, please unmute yourself. So um, thank you everybody for listening. And again, for my colleagues, happy birthday. I think this has been an extraordinary effort to come together to deal with uh, the worst pandemic in over 100 years. I can't emphasize enough the concept, uh, certainly on the vaccine side, that we're only safe if everyone is safe. And I think for us, the challenge has been uh, trying to move away from vaccine uh, diplomacy, which is a way to get vaccines out, but not equitably, to moving to a world of a multilateral solution and to make sure that there's adequate quantities of vaccines made available. And I think we have to do everything we can as a world to do that, including dose sharing we heard about today, making sure there's adequate finance to allow vaccines to be purchased and scaled up and making sure we use every existing facility as Richard has just talked about. That's the way we will get there, and we need to be fleet of foot and adapt as we see uh, the science uh, change as this pandemic continues to evolve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Berkeley. And next is Dr. Philip Dunton from the Executive Director of Unitaid. Philip, please unmute yourself. No, thank you. And I just want to stress um, 
uh, of course, um, the, the partnership that uh, we have with uh, all the organization in terms of ACTA. And again, uh, we welcome trust in terms of therapeutic, but uh, also I mentioned WHO, UNICEF, uh, Global Fund and others. So I think that's the, we have a very clear challenge ahead of us. Um, there is a very clear uh, plan uh, in terms of new therapeutics. And again, I just want to stress that we have to work on all the tools and of course, uh, looking at therapeutics, it's also linked with the access to test. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunton. Next is Dr. Chris Elias, the President for Global Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Elias, please unmute yourself. No, we lost his line, unfortunately. Uh, then we move to Ms. Henrietta Four, from the Executive Director from UNICEF. Uh, Ms. Four, please. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, UNICEF is very proud to be part of the ACT Day Accelerator and COVAX, so happy anniversary to everyone. Um, the race to defeat this virus, we've been talking about it in the last minutes, uh, but equity is extremely important. It's at the heart of it all. We carry the urgent call to focus on the countries and the countries' rollouts. Many countries now are having trouble with increasing levels of debt. And so their domestic budgets are very strained. And there are some very fragile healthcare systems out around the world. So the more that we can do to help fund now these countries so that they can roll out the vaccines, it will help all of us. We want this light at the end of the tunnel to shine on everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Four, and we'll move to Dr. Emma Hanay, the Chief Access Officer at FIND. Dr. Hanay, please. Wonderful. Many thanks for the floor. Uh, FIND co-convenes the ACT Accelerator Diagnostics Pillar together with the Global Fund, uh, working very closely with WHO and, and over 30 partners in the broader pillar, aiming to deliver 900 million affordable quality COVID-19 tests to low middle income countries in 2021. In the last year, we've seen significant uh, uh, wins from having the partners come together around a shared agenda, and that's included in areas like accelerating R&D to be able to, to use uh, R&D investments and technology transfer to drive down the price of rapid tests to $2.50 um, by uh, this year. Um, that includes work on fair allocation and equity of access to key tests by aiming to address the, the supply chain and, and a facilitative volume guarantee that reserved 120 million rapid tests for low middle income countries and work to address the, the Wild West in, in the regulatory and, and policy space for diagnostics, um, which has meant that we had the first two affordable quality antigen rapid tests ready for rollout in, in the case of months, as opposed to, to years or, or decades, which is the, the norm uh, in global health. Uh, but the, the challenge is also significant. And as other speakers have, have spoken to, we've uh, seen an expanded scope and need for diagnostic testing deployed in areas like improving public health response in responding to new variants um, and in the future in, in responding uh, to effective uh, test uh, and treat programs. Um, we're also working to ensure that the ACT Accelerator leaves a legacy. Uh, we know that we will need diagnostics to rapidly and respond and identify uh, the next pandemic. Um, and to be able to respond to the tech next pandemic will require innovation in how tests are developed and in how manufacturing is scaled rapidly to ensure we have the tests needed for the global response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hanai. And uh, we come back to Dr. Richard Hatchett, uh, Chief Executive Officer of CP. Dr. Hatchett, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I would start by just you know, celebrating a, a year of, of partnership today. Uh, and I think we should take pride in the end-to-end the -end mechanism that we have established. I think we need to be humble and we need to recognize that the challenge ahead of us is for the ACT Accelerator now to live up to its potential. I would just add to that, that living up to its potential is not simply a matter of, of delivery and logistics. There are scientific challenges that we still face. We The, the research and development component of, of rising to the challenge of COVID-19 remains 
important. And uh, we look forward to continuing to contribute to the collective effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatchett. Then we move to Dr. Mohamed Pate from the World Bank, the Global Director of Health, Nutrition and Population. Dr. Mohamed, please unmute yourself. Thank you. I think I'll echo what Ms. Henrietta for mentioned. At the end of the day, the tools will be delivered through country health systems. And countries have the responsibility to get ready for the delivery and deployment of those tools uh, equitably within their borders. Uh, training health workers, engaging their own communities to drive demand for the tools, whether vaccines, diagnostics, or therapeutics will be very important. And the ACA partners are rallying around to work collaboratively in supporting countries to be ready, but also to deliver the tools when they are available. And in doing so, not to forget the other crisis, which is also occasioned by the pandemic in terms of basic health services that could be disrupted, such as for mothers, for women, children, and adolescents in many countries. So as we do that, to do that in a coherent manner, and I think that's the way to get out of this pandemic, it's going to be a long game. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pate. And last but not least, we come to Mr. Peter Sands from the Global Fund, the Executive Director at the Global Fund. Mr. Sands, please go ahead. Thank you. As we mark the one year anniversary of the Ag Accelerator, which we are proud to be one of the founder members of and we think has achieved a lot, I think we should also note the fact that three million people have tragically died of COVID-19. And 1.2 million of pe those people died this year in 2021. And moreover, that the true cost of the pandemic is much more than the deaths of those who tested positive with this new virus. We have World Malaria Day arriving on Sunday. And in many of the poorest countries of the world, particularly in Africa, the knock-on impact of the pandemic on malaria in terms of incremental death is likely to exceed the direct impact. The Global Fund uh, responded very swiftly to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we made available last year a billion dollars on top of our normal annual spend of about four billion. And this year have stepped that up further thanks to the generosity, particularly of the United States, but also Germany and the Netherlands. We're making available a further $3.7 billion to help countries respond to the pandemic itself and to mitigate the impact on other diseases such as HIV, TB, and malaria. We're doing this in partnership with our ACT-A um, partners, and we see it as part of the overall comprehensive response that countries need to meet, make towards this crisis. So I don't actually think this is a, a, a moment to celebrate. It's a moment to mark. It's a moment to take stock of the progress we've made, but it's a moment also for us to say we have to do it better. We have to move faster. We have to move comp more comprehensively and we have to move together because we owe it to everyone in the world to, to beat this pandemic and to beat it fast and to do it in a way that leaves no one behind. Thank you so much, Mr. Sands. Now, I thank you all, and with a huge thank you to all your participations and, of course, to your immense contributions. Um, we'll be closing our session today. We will be sending the audio files of today and Dr. Tedros' opening remarks right after the press conference, and the full transcript will be available tomorrow. With this, thank you very much. Happy birthday. And uh, let's move on from here. <laughs> Have a good day.
And thanks so much to our translators for staying on <laughs> this extra time. So sorry for that, but uh, you guys are heroes. Thank you again.